Hello and welcome to another week of Showtime with Jordan Van Haslow and friends here on Hot 702.5 FM, Las Vegas. Today I have an old buddy of mine, very talented director and writer who's patching in uh, from around the world. As a matter of fact, he's in Ireland now, um, Jonathan Kesselman. Thank you so hey. much for joining me. How are you? Thank you. Good, man. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you're here. Right? I, I thought about you the other day and I was like, oh my God, we haven't caught up in forever. How long have you been in Ireland? Because I feel like the last time we like spoke, spoke, you were still in LA. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, been about two and a half years, I think. It was, yeah, we came here in 2018 in May, something like that. And uh, yeah, it's been two and a half years. I was in, I was in uh, the States a couple times over the summer but it's just for work, so I was in and out. And I, I should have, I, I don't know if you're in LA or not when I was out there last summer, but it sounds like you're not. You were in Indio and or Vegas, right? Yeah. So I, yeah, but uh, yeah, there you go. So how but, have you, I'm sorry, go for it. No, no, yeah, so uh, I'll t do you wanna know how, why I got here or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> okay, so like you met my wife, Suzanne, you, you know, she's Irish and uh, um, we had our son here, he's five now, we had him here, uh, Five years ago and I thought we were moving here because you know we have a home in Dublin and a home in the village where we're quarantining right now like in, in a village called Omeet which is a coastal middle of nowhere like rural Irish sort of town and we had him here and we were living here and then I got a job in Atlanta for three months I was working on Ang Lee's last movie and mm -hmm. I um when I came back she was like she was isolated with the baby and she was like I can't be here anymore when you go to LA I'm like oh, I hate LA Went to LA for two and a half years, and <laughs> so we re caught up there, and yeah, and then uh, when Trump got elected, that was I said I, we got to get the fuck out of Dodge. She's like, no, it can't be that bad, and I said, nah, I think it's get bad, it's get bad. <laughs> and I call, we're talking about it this morning. I was like, I call that, like you got really bad. <laughs> You're like, told you so, told you so. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. So speaking of that, how have you been spending your spring break? My spring break, you mean the quarantine or, or <laughs> exactly is that what you're what calling it? About. That's what I'm calling it. <laughs> I like it. Oh boy. My spring break, it's it's less exciting sounding than that. Uh I'm just trying to keep I'm trying to keep saying. So I was working on a on a, a, a TV show all last year and it ended like two weeks before this lockdown happened. And so mm. I grabbed the editing uh, uh software from the office. So I've been teaching myself, reteaching myself how to learn Premiere and other bits of software. I'm writing music with a bandmate of mine in LA and like just learning Logic, which is a, a audio production program. Mm -hmm. And bought a keyboard and I'm learning, teaching myself piano, teaching myself Spanish, watching my kid. You know, like a lot of the days watching my kid because my wife's working still and so, but uh, yeah. And then eating, eating a lot of food, cooking a lot and drinking way too much booze at night. <laughs> this amount of alcohol at night. Well, have you come up with, um, but ha has anything really great come out of your your creativity over this? Like it was like, yeah. oh my god, I have this wonderful idea. Oh my god, I well, wrote this like, song. so we have a couple songs we wrote, and one we just I just I spent last week cutting music video for using all stock footage, and the song it's, it's a work a comedy rock band, and so it's a song called TED Talk, all about like how goof like I, we make fun of TED Talks basically. So that song is now on YouTube, and you know we sent, I sent it out uh, to like just people I knew yesterday, and we got we didn't get a response, uh -huh. so that's been fun and. A couple other songs of working, you know, we had the music written, but now working on lyrics. And then, yeah, and, you know, just, I mean, it's just fun for me. You know, music is just, it, I, I'm not looking for anything out of music. It's not what, how I make a living. It's just more like I enjoy yeah. being creative. Yeah, that's, stuff. No, that, that makes sense. Have you been working on any new um, film ideas? Uh, no, I, I mean, I have this, I have two movies, or three movies, actually, that I've been trying to get made for a couple years. And, and I kind of had this thing in my head where I, I don't want to write anything until the one of these things goes so one of them uh we have we're out we're out to an actor i think is going to come on and we have some money in place for it and it's it's a movie set in ireland like an american in ireland road movie kind of like playing strange automobiles meets local yeah. show, culture clash thing and so that would be the first thing i think I, that looks like it's, it would be going as soon as it opens up here and then ebert hammer too suddenly has a, a a spark of happiness i just bought the not not only the sequel rights, but I, I bought the underlying rights from the new own, the new rights owners, and they're interested in potentially financing and distributing sequels. So that's kind of cool and exciting. And yeah, but yeah, I, I just don't want to write any more movies because it's like I've written so many things that are good that don't get made, and it's like I just was I just want to focus on getting the things that I've written made, and then when one thing goes, I'll write something else because what's the <laughs> point. Oh, like what's the point of writing something? Just to have no more like one more heartbreak, one more sort of struggle uphill to get something made like i'd rather just laser focus on three things and 
No, yeah. totally. That, that makes sense. Do you think that this in the long run, like all of this that's happened will be kind of um, good for filmmaking in the sense that like theatrical is going to not come back quite the same way that it was. And so now like, you know, I know they're all fighting over like windowing because all the studios want to go direct to streaming. Like I kind of, kind of wonder if in the long run, if that'll be better like for the content creator in the sense that there's just, there's, there's more output. But I guess I it could be hearing, a flip side yeah, to it. I, I, keep, I keep hearing that, but it's like, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, honestly, like for me, I, I don't, you know, like it's great seeing your stuff in a theater with people, especially with comedy or, or horror or any kind of like, you know, where like, like with comedy and horror, it's all about like, you know, getting as many laughs from the audience or scares, you know, and sort totally. of saying it's great. And I think doing comedy and seeing it in a theater with people, like the, the laughs sort of spread and, you know, it, it sort of feeds itself. But that being said, I, I mean, for me, like, I just love making movies. I love making people like, and so like, no matter, I don't care how, where they show, I just like, I actually enjoyed the, just the process of it is the, the, the real joy for me. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, I, don't, I just, it's just hard to get anything made. And yeah, I don't know. I, I would like, yeah, it's just difficult. So we'll see. I have no, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I've, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's kind of a, a weird black hole of, yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess no one does. Talk to me about how you got to film. I, mean, I think we had this conversation a long time ago when we first met. But how did how did how did film come? I know you grew up in Los Angeles, but did you grow yeah. up in like the film world, or was your family like in the entertainment no, business? No, my, my mom. My mom was a school teacher. My dad worked for IBM. Um, and I, I, you know, growing up in, I grew up in the Valley. I mean, since you've lived in LA, you know what that means versus like, I, I grew up in the, <laughs> the, the, the blue collar, like, you know, where the grips would live kind of, I didn't grow up in like the, <laughs> the nice part of LA. I grew up in North Hollywood, Van Nuys area. And uh, I always loved, so my dad would take my brother and I to movies. And I, was, I was obsessed with movies. I used to collect like the calendar section from LA times when they would have like the year movies or the, the fall, you know, where it just, I just love movies, but I was always very scared of the business because I met a lot of people in the business who were just, and still are kind of assholes. It's just a very strange business. So I, I ended up getting into, yeah, I get, I got into psychology. That was my, 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 uh, my major in college. But as I was leaving college, I realized that, you know, I didn't want to do neuroscience, which I was sort of gravitating towards. I was working in a lab and, and I then saw this documentary on, uh, a TV show from the fifties called your show of shows that it was like, it was a Sid Caesar show, but it was like every great comedy writer who's Jewish, was on that show. It was like Woody Allen, Mel Brooks, Carl Reiner. Uh, you know, I mean, e you know, it was everybody. And I just like it was one of those moments where like that's what I was put on this earth to do. Like I want to do that, and I didn't know how to get into it. And so I kept asking people for help, and had and, and nobody was helpful. So finally, I was like, well, I'm just going to apply to film school. And then I went to film school, and again, I just wanted to be a writer initially. And then I got into film school and realized that I actually loved directing more than writing. Even like I loved, you know getting bigger and bigger productions and more people and props. I like, I like running the show. I like sort of, you know, I, I just, I just got a, it's a real thrill collaborating with people and yeah. And so, yeah. And then while I was in film school, like I did my second semester, I did a short film called the Hebrew hammer, which then turned into the Hebrew hammer feature. Like literally, I mean, I went, it was the, 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 the movie was on VHS and it was kind of, kind of came like a cult sort of thing in, 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 in the school at USC. People kept asking for videotapes for their, their lawyers or their you know their Jewish neighbors and <laughs> and I was like fuck this is, and and then at the same time like USC chose it as like one of their favorite uh, the archivist chose the the best films short films from USC from 1950 to present and I was there and it, it showed like, my wow. movie and it was like wow I was like I should obviously this idea is really fucking connected with people I should write this and so over the summer I started writing it and then as I was writing it I got one of my tapes went to a friend of mine who his girlfriend or his roommate had a girlfriend who was an agent, something, whatever, some agent saw it and called me and they're like, this is really funny. You've written anything that's a feature. I'm like, well, I'm actually finishing the feature. And then from there, it kind of just took off. And I like, literally, I graduated and went right into making the movie when I was 27. How cool is that? Like to just get that kind of momentum like that early on. Yeah, it, and I wish it happened later through my career. <laughs> it, it, took, it took another 10 years to get my next movie made. So it's just, yeah, I, I, it's just hard. It's, I, it's, it's weird. But it was, but what, uh, no, I'm glad. 
Yeah. What was what was that process like? I mean, like, so you had this agent who really dug in, and like, you had all these folks who were behind the short, and like, oh my god, this is a really awesome concept. What? How challenging was it to to get the feature itself made? No, I mean, what's funny was yes and no. So initially, everybody who read the script was like, it was like a quote unquote hot script in Hollywood. Everyone's reading it like, this is so funny, but it's never going to get made. It's too Jewish. I'm like. Okay, and these are Jews telling me this. I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay Uncle Mordecai, or you know, I don't know. Um, um, so that kept happening, and then then I got a call, from, you know, that this guy Mark Platt, who's a, was he's still a big deal. Mark Platt he used mm -hmm. to run Universal. He he produced La La Land, and like he's a you know he's a big producer. Yeah. He um, met with me, and he's like, I want to I want to I want to do this movie, but it's it's too Jewish. It needs to be like a black Jewish um, you know comedy. We want to develop it with you. And so I started working with him for like two weeks or his development guys. And then I kind of hinted out early on that I want to direct it. Like I've always, always directed everything I've written and it was made clear to me that was not going to happen. You know, they wanted this to be like a Ben Stiller, Chris Rock movie. And, and then <laughs> at the same time, independent film producer by the name of Ed Pressman, who is like, uh, he's been around forever. Ed like produced everything from Badlands to like Wall Street, The Crow, uh, you know, he got his hands on it uh, and was like, look, uh, uh, I can make, I can, we can make your movie for a million dollars total, and you can direct it. And I was like, yes. And, and, and <laughs> like, can I, is that even possible? I, I didn't know. And it was a challenge. It was, it's not a lot of money to make. It was a pretty ambitious movie. So, and that was it. I went off to New York and. And, and then there you go. The rest there is history. Go. I'm always fascinating, fascinated with things that become like kind of cults hits yeah. did that happen like like just 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 um organically or were you guys like like what, like were you doing a lot of marketing of the film when you were no, first no, working no. So on like, it yeah it became cult because there's no marketing so like it you know so we got into sundance uh that, that's when we premiered and prior to us premiering at sundance um the, they showed the movie because they were very confident in the movie so they showed it to the buyers in la and new york simultaneously and all the buyers were like 60 year old men, white men, and they were just like freaked out by the movie. And so nobody bought it. And so at Sundance, we go there and like no buyers are coming anymore, but we were the hot comedy at Sundance. Like people were like shouting, hey, Hebrew Hammer, funny singing something. I'm like, oh, thanks. <laughs> I go to festivals, I went to a, a film festival in Toronto. Uh, There's a Toronto Jew Jewish film festival. It sounds silly, but there's a, this Bloor Theater, like 800 seat theater. And there's like, literally like a blockbuster lines around the block. It sold out. It sold. They, they, they did two screenings of the movie. It was supposed to be one. It was like, holy fuck! Like, <laughs> clearly, this is. But like, you know, it was a thing. And then, but like, it was no one was buying it. But then Comedy Central had seen it and waited. And then they they basically bought the TV rights for half million dollars. But their deal was, well, you're gonna come out in theaters, but you can't show it in theaters until we show it six times on our network first. And we're like, oh, okay, okay. And, and I, yeah, and, and then we had like literally five thousand dollars of marketing money for the theatrical, and so nobody saw in theaters. We're on eight screens, and back then, if your movie when your movie played in a, in a theater, like your box office determined whether or not your movie was like what your career, like is all the numbers in the box office. Yeah, like, I think millions of people or a million people saw it in Comedy Central a month before it came out in theaters, and so it was this weird pre-streaming stuff where, where my movie was like, oh, it was. People like your movie, but it didn't make any money. So I was a screenwriter for a while. So I just made my living writing movies that never got made. And that was frustrating. And, uh, <laughs> but because of the airing on Comedy Central over five years, then that's where the people started discovering the movie. Because, you know, and then that's where it kind of just grew from that. Yeah. Yeah. What did you, so what did you do after that? Because like you have this kind of like really cool experience where this little short film just kind of takes on a life of its own. You're yep. right out of school, so I'm sure you're like, I'm hot shit. Like, yep. <laughs> like <laughs> what I got, there? I got humbled. I got humbled. Yeah, I, mean, I just, <laughs> I, I just did a lot of writing stuff. That you know, and the thing with the studio writing is that these things never like it's so hard to get a movie made, and you learn that. But like, so just writing really good things that you know people would read and like, and then they'd almost go, and then an executive would, what every six months or a year, these in studios, these executives get fired because they make a movie, right. they say yes to a movie, and that movie doesn't do well, and then they get they get fired. So, so I had a project with executives who were like, yes, it's going to happen. If actors are getting attached and then suddenly they go away and then people come in, they're like, oh, it's not my movie. Fuck that movie. I don't want to, I want to do my project. <laughs> so that happened a long time. And I, I got so frustrated with that. Just, I, I like to make things, uh, you know, more writing is whatever, but to make the thing is exciting for me. And so I was like, I, I want to just be on set. So I got into advertising. I tried to get into advertising. So I started doing commercial work and, um, because I prefer to, to do that, to be like, the, just to be able to be on set and call, even if it's for a fucking product, but this call action and cut, like, I want to do that. <laughs> so I did a bunch of that in New York. And um, yeah, and then 
yeah, my next movie came about because um, the star and writer and producer of the movie is a comic who's really funny, a great guy named Maz Jobrani. And if you, you uh -huh. know, people listening to your show don't know, he's like, here nobody knows who he is, but if you're like Middle Eastern or Persian in particular, then he's like, he's like the comic, like he's like the big Persian comic. And somebody suggested me to Maz because he was, he was looking to do a movie in this similar kind of vein, like a silly broad comedy that's culturally kind of like, you know. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and so I directed his movie in 2014. It came out in 2016. It's a really, it's still a very, it's a very funny movie called Jimmy Vesvet, American Hero. But again, it was made for, you know, the Persian community. So it was, you know. This is very like niche. Very niche yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can watch it on Showtime, but like, you know, it's, it's still like, it's not, you know, yeah. And, uh, but that was amazing. And that was a great experience. And then what else? I, like, I've also, like I, I, I mentioned, I did, um, I had one of the coolest jobs I ever had was a couple of years ago, I got to write and direct second unit on Ang Lee's last movies. So I got to work with Ang Lee and John Toll and all these like legends that, I would never, yeah. you know, I do comedy. These are like Oscar winning people. And I was like getting to work with them and, and like be a, <laughs> a department head. And it was such a really amazing experience. And it was really good for my confidence in the, the sense that like, I was like, I can play at this level. I, I, you know, this is a $50 million studio movie and I've been entrusted to this big thing. And I'm like, I can do this and I can work with these people and, you know, I can hang at this level. And so yeah so that was great and then what else like last year i had one another very very cool job and hopefully it'll be coming out sometime uh randomly a tech millionaire was looking to do a, a political or not a political comedy show like a, a fact-based comedy so, you know, like he's obsessed with like john oliver yeah or, uh, uh you know and so but he wanted to do like a sketch version of that and so he, for a year he'd been trying to get it going but he didn't he'd need, he needed someone like me to actually put it together and so i met him and mm -hmm. then he hired me to show run the show called gander and it was initially going to be like this very small Irish thing. And I was like, well, all the comics I know are kind of American comics. So suddenly we have like Lewis Black and Rachel Dratch and, you know, Jay Moore. And, and so it's a really funny show. I brought on my friend, Rob Kuttner, who uh, was, he won like five Emmys for writing for The Daily Show. Like fact-based comedy is his like back, you know. His it's like his, it's his, yeah, yeah, for it. And so every, every episode is based on a piece of research. Like, and so we have six episodes we did. So I, and uh, the, the episodes range from things like exploitation of death to like food delivery services, how they're screwing you to like, um, you know, the cult of work, how we sort of uh, fetishize work. So it's all really interesting stuff based on real numbers and statistics, but you know, but it's really sketch, heavily sketch based and kind of irreverent and it's fun. So yeah, we did six of those and we're now trying to sell it because initially it was going to be for YouTube only. Then he decided, to, he just said he wanted to sell it instead. And and that's kind of the, that's where it was before COVID hit. And, uh, <laughs> and now, now I, I sit at home, drink wine and write stupid songs. Everything, right, <laughs> right, stupid song. So having had all of these various experiences, like the doing like the advertisement, now having worked with Ang Lee on his project, is like comedy like where your heart is? Or do you kind of have, are you kind of forming the idea to maybe direct the, the next great American cinema no, masterpiece? No, I could ask, you know, it's like, it's, I comedy was what I, what I wanted to do and com to me like the, the, the joy in it is not just the making of it, it's also like making people like when I was I was a very unhappy kid at a kind not the best you know a lot, a lot of us haven't had good childhoods I don't have the best childhood and mm -hmm. I was very miserable and I remember seeing um <laughs> it's not the best show but it was the Prince of Bel-Air and I was just miserable and depressed and anxious and just really and then there's laughing and it was like realizing that like someone can make you laugh you get like pure bliss for like whatever a couple seconds where you're usually just miserable. Like that's a really powerful thing to be able to make someone laugh, to bring, you know, that kind of happiness to somebody. And I want to learn how to do that. And so like, I've always, yeah, I'd like, and I've only gotten better at making comedy and I want to keep doing it. I, I'd like to have one that's financially successful so I can, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they're always good, they're always good. I just, I can't control the, uh, the marketing side of things. What um, was it like? What was it like going to um, to Ireland? I know your wife's your wife's family is from Ireland, but mm -hmm. but you're like an Angelino. And you've worked in Los Angeles. I know you were in New York for a while. Like, was it kind of like starting over from scratch, or did you like kind of ease well, into yeah, the well, community there? It, it both. So when I first so when I first I thought I moved out here, and I had my son, I I signed with a commercial agent. And so I had done like a little bit of commercial work here. I did some spots for um, Irish Rail, which is like the uh, the Amtrak of Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but then I went back to the States. And when I got back out, uh, yeah, for the first 10 months, I wasn't working because I didn't know anybody. And I didn't, you know, I was teaching. So I was, I got a job teaching at a university called uh, 
Griffith University. And then, yeah, th then this job happened. This all last year, I was like literally working 24 seven on the show and not hiring all sorts of people. So I've, I've met like the community. Like I know all the really funny people in Ireland now and they know me and I've worked like, like I know, I know Cruz now. And so, yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm now in, in this sort of the world here. And, I, and I've also did, I've done some other commercials since then. So yeah, I feel like I'm now, people know who I am here. Yeah, well, so that that's good. good. Do you miss living in, in, in Los Angeles at no, all? I fucking, I hate LA. I went back, <laughs> twice, went back twice for the show and uh, yeah, I just, I'm so happy I got out. And in New York as well, I'm back to New York and New York was so exhausting to me. Just, <laughs> you know, I met you in New York and it's just like, it, you got at midday or get off the subway, you're like, I'm just tired sleep now like i'm just it's too much it's yeah too, you know it's just it's intense and how just going out is. to get your like coffee just feels like an effort yeah you know, i get it yeah and, and it's expensive rates, yeah. <laughs> expensive as hell like i was out there for work and i was like expensive a lot of things but i'm still dropping like gajillions of dollars just you know you go into a breakfast place like 25 dollars for eggs and like what the fuck is that like you can't well, isn't, isn't yeah. that what they always say something like there's like a 20 dollar toll on your yeah. front door in New York, like yeah. no matter what you're doing, you're, you're going to spend more at least than twenty dollars. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and, and this is why I love Ireland. When I, I kind of had this realization, so I started. I've been coming here a lot because when I first started dating my wife, you know, I'd come every Christmas. And the way I would sort of see Ireland versus New York, when you land in the airport in New York, it's like you lose 20, ten bucks immediately. Like it's a three dollar ATM fee to get money out of the ATM machine. <laughs> they charge you six dollars for the cart. You know, like like a copy, you know, the copy's nine dollars, whatever it is. In Ireland, you know, the Wi-Fi is free, the cards are free, like it's just, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's more of a socially minded place. Like, you know, even right now with the COVID thing, like I know that in the States, people are maybe getting a $1,200 flat check, you know, maybe, and that's yeah. impossible to get that. Whereas here, like you just, you know, if, you, if you're not working your hours reduced, you just go to the website and say, here's what's going on, give your bank information. And then every Tuesday, I'm getting 350 euro, I'm getting 1400 bucks a month just to just stay to, home. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like, it's like they, they, you feel like you're looked after here. Like, just it just makes me hate. I don't hate America, but I hate what America's become. And I, it's, and uh, yeah, and just seeing now what's going on with not only how he fuckface who should not be named, how he handled the, 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 the coronavirus <laughs> thing, but the, the the riots going on, it's just. Well, it's bizarre to me. Well, not bizarre, but it's what's so strange to me is that it's like all of these things are converging at once. Like this isn't just about George Floyd's death. This is no. about the coronavirus. This is about, it's like all of these it's, things have just kind of like totally bubbled up. And it's like, well, I, I think America has been broken for a long time and people are starting to realize it and to, the, to the point where now it's just like, it's tipping point. Like there's no social, there's, 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 there's no social safety net. Racism has been a problem since the country was formed and it's, you know, and it, and, and, and the police brutality thing has been going on forever. And, you know, and it's been in the spotlight now because of cell phone cameras, but still, but then you put people inside with no money, no jobs, you know, uh, shitty police, you know, you're on edge. And then they've been, and then they've, and then they've been stuck at home for the last two months on yeah. top of it, right? So and, then, and, you know, Trump so is just, and, and, and Trump is not helping. He's just throwing gas on the fight. Like, it's just, yeah, I, it's been there, man. And I have like, it's depressing. Because I still read the, the the American, you know, I read the Washington Post, New York Times every day, and it's just it, when I remember when I left, it was so stressful to read the paper and to, you know constantly just, uh, a Trump, 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 and how awful it is. And it's like on your phone. Now it's I feel I feel less attached to it. Like it's a little, a little more because you're a little separated. You're a little separated yeah. from it. You're not and I just like feel, I feel with it. Man, I feel bad. For, like there's a, a really a great um, op-ed writer here named Fintan O'Toole wrote an article about how Europeans are not just pity, like we used to fear America and be like ins be inspired by America or whatever, now we're just pity America. And that's that's a shitty place to be. And, but yeah, you know, I, I don't know what's, I, I feel like this end of an empire and I feel like it's, you know, the rotting corpse of democracy and I feel like. Well, that's what a friend of mine, we talk and it's sort of like every day, like it's like, oh my God, the world is ending, it's over. It was nice knowing you. But then the next day you'll see something, you'll be like, okay, this is maybe a little inspiring. Like this is gonna, be yeah. a good positive change and then the next day you're like yeah no 
no, the world's yeah. over. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's not the world. I hate to think about Americans. I, when I was there, it was this way too. It's, Americans are very American centric. Like I look on Facebook, like most of my Facebook friends are, are American. And they're like, they're making the coronavirus thing like a, a blue state versus red state thing. You know, well, don't lock us in. I'm like, no, no, you understand every country in the world is doing this. You're, there's other places. There's, I mean, we don't care about your, your red fucking blue. Like, you know, like we have scientists, smart people here are going, we're not worried about you. They're worried about their citizenry going, no, no, you can't leave the place. It's not, it's not being locked in because you're Democrat or Republican. Like, it's just, yeah, it's crazy. Everything's so, become like, yeah. Every, well, everything is totally politicized and it's, it's, it's sad. And it doesn't help that this is an election year on top of it. So it's just, you know, I don't know. What's it like? So your kid, right? So your kid has always just grown up in Ireland, right? No, whole, he, he like, lived in L- LA with, for two and a half years with us. And for, so. But like as a kid, but I mean, like as a little kid, he's like, what, two? when you guys moved it, we, we moved when he was one or right. you know, almost one and then we moved here when he's like three and a half or three or three and a half well yeah. so okay so but now like he starts is it strange as an american and like we haven't been born in la to kind of like raise an irishman no like, I, it, that, that was a big reason for why we moved here it was sort of like i grew up in la and i grew and it was not a good place to grow up and and i've like a guy i work with uh he's a little, like 10 years older than me his son was in rehab for like every drug ever. And I'm like, I know how that happens. And here it just felt like he's gonna be growing up in a safer, saner place. He's gonna have a, it's just, I think it's a better place for him to grow up. And I'm sure he's got an American passport. He can go whenever he wants. And, you know, I just feel like at least to grow up in a, a place that's more community focused and where people are nice and not, it's not all about money. Like I, for myself getting out here, I it really, I'm, I mean, when you're raised in America, you're sort of, you have this inner voice telling you that you're, you're only good if you, money is success. Like, you know, mm-hmm. you're only achieving if you're making money and it's all, it, it, everybody's sort of lowering that over you and you see your face constantly. And I got here, it really did, it just unwound me from that. It's, it hears more about, you know, you know, they call it the crack, C-R-A-I-C. And it's like, it's where they use constantly. Crack is like, it's f- the pursuit of fun, like drinking, conversation, you know, music. Like what's the crack, is the crack, it was the crack mighty, it, it, so that's the important thing here as opposed to money. And it's like, so suddenly like that, that feeling like I'm not worthy unless I'm making money or do or I'm a job or that I got in LA or New York is gone. It's just now like, that's, I love this job I have and I do it, but like, it's not who I am. And I want him, I want that for him. I want him to be a person first and not like what he, his identity is. <laughs> job as or, opposed you know, to money like being yeah. like an anxious Angelina or an anxious yeah. New Yorker who's always yeah. got that. That makes sense. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I gotta hustle. I gotta hustle. I gotta hustle. It's like eh, you don't have to do anything. You can just kind of, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, that seems like a really lovely way to live. Has that? Has that? Has that? Like now being in that environment and really like leaning into that environment, has that changed your perspective on just like your career and how you go about pursuing things? And one hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. I just stopped feeling desperate and caring about like who's. Do- and also, like being in LA, as you know, it's like. It, I have a lot of friends who are very successful in the business and you see like their stuff on billboards all over the place when you're not working. <laughs> when you're working, everything's great. You know, when you're not working, it's just like, God, Jesus Christ. I'm like, yeah, but uh, yeah, but it has, like I, I'm less caught up in it. And, you know, I, I do the things that I do because I'm excited about them and, and it's not, yeah, it's not for the money it's for, because I like, I want, I think this will make a mark and it's people are going to really enjoy this and I want to do that. And yeah, so I do. Do you think that? Totally. So you said you're not going to write anything else until you. Well, I, 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 will, I, will, I will take it back. So last year I was <laughs> the, the, the show I was running. I wrote like so Rob was Rob was a lead writer. He would write the first pass, and he and I would we'd write it. So I mean, did a lot of writing last year. But yeah, I don't want to write another movie until I get one made, just because I have three that are really good with various actors attached. So what's the point of me writing something only to get something else in the, the process of three or three, three to 10 years to get it made? Like, why not just... Just kind of focus on what you focus. have and like really or, hide and, it. Yeah, or something comes my way that's it's pretty good and they have money, they want to make it and they, or it could be better and they want to hire me to rewrite and do, like, yeah, sure. But I just want to make things. I don't want to do something just to do it. Like, I'd rather write a song that I can put on the internet and like 600 people see than like, I'd just rather do that. You know what I mean? So, yeah, totally. Now, how long have you been? I know you said you're you're playing, you're you're, you're teaching yourself piano. How long have you been a musician, and what do what other what other instruments do you play? Well, I play bass. So in my band, I play bass, and I used to play guitar. Um, I didn't play music since I was a kid. My sister's a music teacher, so I just you know grew up with music. 
but uh, the piano I've been playing for about five weeks. And so Quincy Jones has this amazing, I'm not a show for Quincy Jones. He's got an amazing piece of soft <laughs> thing called uh, Playground Sessions that I've been using. It's very commercial, but it's great. Like it really, so I, it's, you know, it's, it's an incredible lap. Like I'm, um, it's, yeah, it's like kind of gamifies piano playing. And so I'm practicing every day and it's, yeah, it's getting more and more difficult, but I'm learning, you know, I'm getting better. And better and, yeah. I just, it's something I, I've always wanted to play piano. I've always wanted to, and I used to be able to read music and I, and I just, I'm always been a musical person, but I, I stopped being able to read music and now I'm learning to read music again. Cause it's like, I, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to do it, I, I have time to do it. I might as well do it right. And yeah. So, but. Uh, well, I think yeah. that that's what so much of the last few months have been about for like everybody kind of like trying new things and like figuring out like what makes you happy what would be interesting or what would be what's this and you said you're also learning a new language as well spanish well i'm kind of so i took three years of of, of espanol in, 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 high, in high school <laughs> and uh but i i at that time in my life i wasn't really focused on academic i didn't care so i kind of just sort of coasted through it but i had a, a little bit of a basis of, of it and so i was I, this another thing called Duolingo, I'm sure you know of. It's like this I free language. Yeah, yeah. It's great. Yeah. And so initially I was like, I'm gonna learn Gaelic. My wife's Irish, my, my son's gonna learn Gaelic. It's the Irish language. And I did about for five minutes and that language has no basis in any, like it's just fucking this ancient, like it makes no <laughs> sense what's, I'm like, fuck that, I'm depressed, isn't it? I don't want to be like, <laughs> I'm back to Spanish. At least I can have some wins every day. I can feel like I'm actually, you know, it's not, everything is brand new, like so. <laughs> so I'm in Spanish also for about six weeks and I'm, yeah, it's, I'm getting, I'm getting up there, do about a half an hour, do an hour a day. And, and uh, I'm, I wish I, I wish I were that disciplined. I'm like really bad. Like I'll start, like I first downloaded Duolingo, Duolingo um, when I went to Italy a couple of years ago and I was like, yeah. okay, I'm going to get a little conversationally and I start out so good. Like, okay, from nine to 10 a day, I'm going to do my Italian lesson. Then Tuesday, okay, from nine to 10, I'm going to do my lesson. Then Wednesday, oh, okay, maybe I'll look at it for 20 minutes. I'm, I, I, like, don't have the discipline. It's so bad. Well, I, like, I, what, what I love about that program is they help you. They're like, you know, other people are beating you on the leaderboard. Or, like, <laughs> you know, if you don't practice today, you're going to lose your 35-day your, your streak. And I'm like, oh, no, I need to practice. And so, like, they do kind of help. They, can, they guilt you into, like, getting back into it. Like, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, just, I mean, it's not, it's not like I'm, I don't know. It's just, I, I also, like, a, what I've learned about myself over the last 20 years, if I don't have a project, if I don't have things to be into, I'm an obsessive person. And yeah. I will turn that obsessiveness into, onto myself. And that's a real problem. So I'd, I'd rather, you know, like, I can't get that fucking song down or I can't figure out the lyrics of this, you know, or this movie, I can't figure it out. Like, I'd rather have that as a problem than me, whatever nonsense I have in my head, whatever stories I'm telling myself in my head. So I, I like apply, I like getting myself out of my head into something else. So that's... That makes sense. That makes sense. Is your process, like, are you a very, like structured person like the person who like your whole week even no, working from home your whole week is planned or do you just kind of wake up and just say like oh you know, I'm gonna I'm play the, the piano today <laughs> yeah. no it's every day like today i'm gonna my free time i'm gonna play the piano in spanish i don't have anything i mean when i'm on a when i'm on a movie i'll get when i'm on a show or a movie i get very very uh uh yeah like i'm constantly writing notes 24 like because i can't remember anything I'm always like writing notes and, and like obsessing about what needs to happen and what hasn't happened, what I'm what I should be doing, and like that's nonstop. Like, and I have to like go home and like make a real concerted effort to get myself out of my obsessiveness about that thing. But like right now in COVID world, I'm you know it's like I know I want to play piano every day because I want to get better and I want to do Spanish every day, and but I don't have a plan. No, I just kind of <laughs> roll out of bed later. Like, I roll out of bed later than I want to be rolling out of bed because I'm always drinking at night, and then. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I just want to make the days move by at a, a better speed and come out come out of this at least with some stuff, you know, like I, I learned Spanish, yeah. I learned a, a editing software, I learned a music software, I learned, you know, like, yeah. What about you? So, How, like, what, what, what's your day like? What do you... Uh, oh my goodness, my day, I feel like my day is all over the place. I'm like the least, like I said, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not detail oriented. I'm not, um, um, I'm making myself sound so horrible but no like I, I usually I usually have the type of thing where you know like I'll like I'll record uh, the shows on a specific day I usually dedicate like a day to like okay I need to um uh deal with my charity I'm, I'm the board president of the EAA so okay this will be charity day what's the charity They're like what, what, what so the what entertainment aid alliance the entertainment aid so so it's called the Entertainment Aid Alliance, and it was founded 
maybe 30 years ago by a group of friends and colleagues out of home entertainment, out of the studio system. It was like the height of the AIDS epidemic. Um, and so they created what was called at the time VIAC, the Video Industry AIDS Action Committee. And so they operated as a, as a pass-through. So they'd raise as much money as they could and then give as much money of it away. So cut, cut to like 10 years later, 2000s, it became clear that video wasn't actually a thing anymore. <laughs> so they changed their name to the EAA, the Entertainment AIDS Alliance. And so I got involved maybe, I don't know, 2017, 2016. One of my neighbors um, who worked at Warner, she was on the board and she like pinned me down. She's like, hey, my charity's planning our gala and we want to get some you know, younger people involved with it. Um, and so I said, sure. And I joined their steering committee. And the following year, I was elected board president. Wow. And so the mandate that I have and what our mission has been is just to expand beyond just HIV and AIDS. Um, so what we did is we dropped um, the S. So now we're the Entertainment Aid Alliance. And we basically raise money in, um, for services for all types of things that affect folks who work in the industry. So for that's example- right. that's, that's amazing. By the way, I'm gonna thank you. It's very nice that you're Oh, doing thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> like for example, we have, um, we have a fund called the Mark Berman Fund who was, who was a, a deceased board member. And basically um, it provides emergency grant money for folks living with AIDS. So if you yeah. work in the entertainment industry now or have in the past, uh, you know, for whatever reason it may be. So like for, for transportation, for housing, for medical costs or food costs, you can get an, an emergency thousand dollar grant. And we're in the process of instituting a grant that mirrors that, but specifically for cancer. So if you've worked oh. in the entertainment industry or you work in the entertainment industry and you're living with cancer and you need emergency funding, boom. So That's little amazing. by little, little That's by right. little you're, works. You're, you're, you're a part of the solution, I'm part of the problem. That's amazing. <laughs> doing that. Indeed. On behalf of every entertainment industry, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. So that's so that's really it. And I'm just I'm just I'm just really bad because it's so easy to stay in the in the bed, and then you're like, oh. okay, well maybe just after, okay, maybe after the view, I'll get up and start doing everything. Well, okay, maybe after Wendy, I'll. Get up. <laughs> it's fine, man. You know, honestly, like, I, I, like I, I've had this, like, you know, so I have a five year old and we first started, you know, there's only so many, I'm teaching them to read, but there's only so many hours a day you can entertain a five-year-old and you know, five-year-olds need to be entertained. And finally, I was just like, he's watching some TV and I was feeling guilty about it. I'm like, you, can, you know what? I, if I need more glasses of wine at night to get through this, he needs to watch some TV. Like, TV. Whatever. <laughs> like, if we're all going to stay sane, like, I, I can't, this is not a normal time. I can't, you know, when this ends, we'll be back to our routine and he'll be in school and all, but like, yeah. Yeah. It's just, is it like, I, so I, I guess the point is you should be easy on yourself and just whatever gets you through, you should be okay with and see, it's just Judy or whatever the fuck it is you're watching. <laughs> Watch it, enjoy it, and it's all good. Has it has it been difficult um, being quarantined? I mean, you know, we all love our families, but twenty four seven is a lot. Yeah. With a five year old who needs to be entertained. With a <laughs> yeah, it has been. There are some days that are really bleak, and some days are really good. It's just yeah. And there's you know, I mean, when we first started out, there's a lot of fighting because we we're all just sort of, I guess, anxious about it, but also like just not used to being together all the being, time and then yeah and then you get and then you kind of get through it so i mean so it's made us stronger it's also been yeah it can be hard sometimes so i mean but i i know from talking to lots of friends everywhere that's the same for everybody so i can't you know I'm, you gotta be I, i'm i'm quarantining a place that's really beautiful we're on the water like it could be a lot worse you know what i mean and, yeah and I, I i i can imagine being in new york right now in my old shoebox yeah. apartment and you you live in your apartment because it was like your apartment's just to sleep you, you the city was where you, you live totally right? so, and to be in that little fucking apartment and you can't and just in the middle of a, of a, a, a epicenter of a disease like fuck that that would be horrible yeah it has made you like kind of rethink everything you always kind of thought was like what you want or what what ideal would yeah. be i i definitely when I still talk to my friends in new york it's like my one friend she's like she hasn't left the house since may 28th and i'm like oh my goodness she must be like she must be going insane going crazy going crazy because it's not like you have backyards or even anything to remotely allow you to yeah, yeah feel, although feel like you're in nature or you're just you're just not in this it, because you know if you, i'm sure you've experienced in the, the, the days and the weeks everything kind of is very sort of slipping away in a weird way and like you don't you don't know where you are exactly like, yeah every every day is like sunday it's like <laughs> basically i yeah. feel like i feel like the last few months it just has been just one 
continuous Zoom call. And yeah. I never know what day it was. <laughs> I can never remember like, wait, did we talk about that on Tuesday or did we talk about that on Wednesday? Or then I'll start talking to people about something that I actually spoke to someone else about because it's just Funny. all just, <laughs> it's all one bit blur. But I kind of wonder though, like, um, you know, once, you know, the world does completely open up, is it gonna be like kind of a shock to people? Like, wait, what do you mean I have to leave my hat? Wait, I have to yeah. put on pants and like go into an office? What's an office? I have yeah, <laughs> you know, just, I, I, do, I do want to, uh, it'd be nice to travel or it'd be, it'd be nice to actually just have friends over, you know what I mean? And have like a dinner, yeah. just, just to connect with friends and be, not on Zoom, just to, yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll get there, like on Monday, we're, we're going to phase two of the opening up of the society thing, so. You can now then travel 20 kilometers within your home as opposed to like five kilometers. You can have four people over for visits if they're socially yeah. distant. So it'll just, a, yeah, it is what it is, you know? I mean, it, yeah, what's, so what's the, what's the mood been like there in Ireland just over the course of this COVID thing? People here have been really, like, our leaders are really good. Like, it was explained very well to us. And, you know, every, you know it's, I think the mood is, you know, we're, you know, and also, I, I, again, like that payment that most people are getting, that COVID payment really does help because you're not stressed out about groceries and, you know, mm -hmm. like you can actually live and rents and mortgages if you wanted them to could be stalled. And so it's, you know, I mean, we're just kind of like, we, we, we know we have to do this. Um, it worked, you know, we had a pretty aggressive lockdown, but, you know, our cases are like basically down to nothing at this point. And so they're, oh, that's they're cool. speeding up the opening up. Of, it's just a, yeah, so it's you know i mean it's been tough for everybody in the world i know but like at least i feel like uh we have good leadership and there's some sort of safety net here you know economically and yeah. how do you how do you think from just a writing standpoint thinking about like things going back into production like do you think that the pandemic and coronavirus is gonna like kind of affect like the stories you tell or how you tell stories like i was just you know thinking about like like Makeout scenes and like yeah. big crowd scenes and like have, have you funny yeah I've played that at all yeah no I've had conversations like so the 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 guy who brought me onto Aang's movie is a, a pretty big producer and we were talking about it and he brought up this thing I saw an article about it called virtual production so a lot of studios are going towards this thing called virtual production in which like imagine like a, a car with like a Google camera it'll go out to like a set like a, a, a an Irish road and it'll just it'll take a three hundred and sixty degree model of the entire scene. And that's the set and they have these led panels on a sound stage the actors can work individually on the stage and then they'll also scan each actor so like a digital model so they can do it over the shoulder of a, mo a digital model onto another actor so actors don't have to interact limited crew interacting and that i mean seems cool but it's also that's a that's like a, a studio level money kind of thing like you can't do that as an independent filmmaker so i don't know i mean here they're opening up production i think and i think we'll go first and you know, one of the things I was thinking about is, well, what do we just quarantine everybody? You get get all the actors and crew in one place for two weeks, and then, I, yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't yeah. know. I think yeah. Tyler Perry suggested something along those lines, about based on the fact that his that's based on the fact that his studio is basically like I think it's an old army compound barracks. So like, like they have dormitories, and just talking about quarantining people for the two weeks beforehand and for like all of production. It's just so weird because I just think about life and just how interact, like even taking meetings with people and all. It's like, it's just gonna be so strange to see how um, things are gonna move forward, like how deals are gonna be made, like how it, it, it just, it just feel like everything, everything that we're used to doing is gonna change really significantly. And I think it's just really strange, especially in a town like, Los Angeles, which is so much about show and yeah. being social and interacting and showing off. It's like, I, did, I, did, I, did, I'm, well, I I'm, I'm actually happy about that. Like, you know, like <laughs> I, 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 what I hated about LA was, I just felt like you spent your life doing meetings for the sake of meetings. These meetings never went anywhere. They never led to actual income or business or project. Like it's just, people just want to meet. And it's like, <laughs> you know, if you want to do that, we still do that, but I'm going to do it from my house on Zoom. You can meet all you want. Like, is it, do we have do we have money ready to go? We're ready to make the movie. Let's go, then I'll show up. This, that, that, I don't mind that at all. And ha, yeah, and being in my car twenty four seven, Jesus Christ. So I mean, I think yeah. for a lot of ways it, it, it's good. You know what I mean? But uh, yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, I don't know. So nuts. 
Do you do, do, have all of the various streaming um, serv uh, service providers like opened up for business in Ireland? Like, of course, I'm sure the Disney Plus has, and because I've yeah, been so watching. I'm sorry, go for it. Yeah, no, I was gonna say. So I I got Disney Plus for my my son's like just when this happened specifically. We have Netflix. Um, I can't get Hulu here. I tried because I wanted. There's a show called uh, uh, Normal People. That's an RT. It's a big hit out here that I wanted to see, but I can't get it unless I have a VPN on. Um, and HBO Max, I haven't tried, but but honestly, like every you know, most people, not me, uh, use BitTorrent sites to steal stuff. I would never do that. I would never steal <laughs> never. anything that's illegal, and it takes money out of the pockets of everybody in the entertainment industry. So yeah, I would never. Do that. <laughs> I just find it so like overwhelming because like I, I I in like the last like two months, so aside from like the Netflix and the Hulu, I got Disney Plus. I have BritBox. I have HBO Max, NBC is about to release Peacock, I think, in yeah. a couple of weeks, Apple TV Plus, and I find now, like, I spend, there's, there's too much choice. Too much stuff. Like, and I feel yeah. like I spend so much, so much time just going from one to one, but not really able to find yeah. anything. And, yeah, and, uh, I, you know, I got a free trial for Apple Plus, and I watched, like, one or two things, and their stuff is just not it was uh, like uh, amazing <laughs> stories. I loved as a kid, loved amazing stories. I watched the, the remake of it or the redo of it. And it was, I watched two of them. Like, this is terrible. Like, this is just so, I haven't seen so it. bad. And uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I don't know. There's too much choice and I don't know what to watch unless it's like, I'm hearing about it a lot on social media. So I did I just watch the, the, the last dance. I'm like, Jordan thing, which was amazing. I don't know if you watched that at all. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Fan, yeah. yeah. I'm from Chicago. Oh, <laughs> have you seen it? Have you, have you watched it? I've, I've, I've watched the first one. Oh, it gets it's so, so good. So I'm not, like, I'm not I, done with it yet. Yeah, I, I just didn't, you know, I've always was, I grew up with the Bulls and, you know, I was a Lakers kid, but like, I was always in awe of him, but I didn't know how, how intense and cool, like, he's just a, he's just a really <laughs> interesting, interesting person. And like, and then Pippin and the Rodman thing, it's just, it's fucking brilliant. It's really good. Um, and what else? I, uh, Succession, I finally watched that, and that's great. So can I tell you, I have to start Succession over, because I remember the first, when it, I watched it when it first came out, and I was totally confused about it, because yeah. they really promoted it almost like a, like a billions, or like, like it's this like sweeping family drama. And so I'm watching it, and then like the guy will say something just totally left of center, and I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense. And yeah. so I tried it, and after like a couple of episodes, I'm like, this is just, I don't, what the hell? And it was only yeah. after I stopped watching it that I realized that it was a Will Ferrell thing. And I'm like, oh, this is supposed to be funny. It's so just now I want to rewatch people are so, <laughs> The people are so awful. They're so powerful and awful. And, and, and it's just, and Brian Cox is so mean. And, and like, they're all mean because of him. And it's just, it's really great and the, the dialogue is really great yeah so you should check it no, out i think you'd like totally. it well, and, and season two's better i think yeah because that's because i realized oh i'm watching this from the wrong because i'm thinking it's supposed to be this like serious drama and i'm just like this is not computing i don't understand yeah. why is he making that smirk why did he say that but i think i want to re i want to rewatch that because what I about you is, is, there, is there anything i should be watching that i haven't what so, well, Hulu, you don't get the Hulu, so never but mind. But I do watch this show called Devs that a friend told me that I think's on Hulu. And I, 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 I haven't I, watched I, that yet. It, it starts off amazing, and then it just, it, like, it, and then once the idea, sort of the sci-fi of it is kind of put out there, it kind of starts going downhill and doesn't sort of, it, but it looks really cool, and the, the tone's really cool. It's just not as good as it could have been. But it's, yeah. it's, cool. it's worth checking out for sure. Okay, I'll check that. I, I just finished on Hulu watching Mrs. America. I don't know if that's aired I mean, I, I there or not. So fascinating. So it's Kate Blanchett, and she plays Phyllis Schlafly, and it's all about uh, the Equal Rights Amendment getting passed. So just this, and you know, Phyllis Schlafly was like very conservative, homemaker, blah, 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 versus like the Gloria Steinem. And so it was, aside from the fact that it's like really good, like the cast is like, it's like Margot Martindale, Tracy Ullman. Wow. Um, aside from the fact that the cast, it was just really amazing just to kind of watch it from an historical perspective, because like yeah. I didn't even realize until the postscript at the end that the ERA never actually passed. So the really? women's rights, yeah, really? and like the the last state ratified, like I think it was Illinois, it ratified like this year, but like Senate won't push it forward, and it's so just it was it was just really well written, it was really well acted, and I learned something, and when all three of those things happen, that's, that's a, a pretty that's good a, show. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, Miss America, 
It's, it's, it's called Miss Americana or Miss America? Mrs. America. Mrs. America, okay. I'll Mrs. America, yeah, it was really good. And then um, Little Fires Everywhere was really good, too. I, I, I was, think that the Reese Witherspoon thing, is that, is that what that yeah, is? Yeah, and Carrie Washington. It was okay. adapted, I guess, from a novel. I think, I feel like she's been killing it. Like, I feel like yeah. the last few things that she's, like, attached herself to or she's done has been really, really good. Because yeah. I watched that um, that morning show on Apple Plus with her. How was it? Jennifer. I enjoyed it. I liked it a lot. I actually, let me say this. I'll go back for a second season. I think Jennifer, yeah, I think Jennifer is an interesting just because like her personality, she doesn't like lend herself to being like a morning talk show host. Yeah, like she's, you know, she's really dry, but um, I think that her and, and, and Reese really interact well together. And I think that the story is engaging. It's, you know, sort of ripped from the headlines because they pull some of like the Matt Lauer stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but I enjoyed it, but that's about the only thing on Apple TV plus. I don't even know what they're doing there. Cause they don't seem to be developing anything. They have like eight programs. Yeah. I mean, I, I they probably still have enough money to, to, to support their programming. I mean, Apple, like they, they have, they have no money. They're just, Broke, poor company. What, what are they? <laughs> <laughs> what's the what's the TV in, 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 in what's the TV uh, season like there? Like, is there like in, in Ireland? Is there like a traditional like pilot season and all of that? No, jazz, or? There, 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 there's only really one and a kind of a half pl- like studio. Like, there's one network that are called RTE, uh, Radio Television Ireland. You know, it's a uh, state supported so it's it's financed by by tv license you know so basically if you have a tv here you're supposedly supposed to pay like 100 bucks a year to have your tv which nobody uh-huh. does and so they don't have a lot of money and they're i met with them and their programming is uh not great because it, there's a it's a bureaucratic place and i think a lot of it a lot of the reason why the it's pe- like people who it's like a, it's like a state job or government job so the people who are the executives there just don't want to do anything yeah. and they don't have to because it's a pension kind of thing and the programming is not really good, and there's a, and Virgin Media now has a TV have a TV station, but they're not really doing scripted stuff. They're doing more like sort of they're buying the Judge Judy's or like sports or like so it's not you know so a lot of the TV is UK TV. So like you know it, you know um, the stuff my wife loves to watch. And there's a lot of it, it seems like sort of the house shows, like the house renovation shows or the cooking shows. Yeah. A lot of that stuff. Uh, there are some good UK shows, but uh, the, those shows are getting American too. But um, yeah, there's, there's not a lot of. Uh, I'm developing a show with a company out here. We'll see, um, with Adam Goldberg in this company, uh, about you know, I, it's just a t- typical standard setup. But I thought it'd be really funny because I live in this small village where there's five yeah. people, and I'm like a I'm a weird anomaly. I'm like this Jewish entertainment guy from America. <laughs> um, so uh, and it's all farmers and stuff here. So the premise is like Adam plays like a bro- like a studio Broadway director. He's like really uppity and just up his own ass. And he witnesses a mob hit and gets put in witness protection and sent to the, you know, because he's kind of high profile to this little village in, in Ireland. Yeah. He decides to put on a, a production of Hamilton with all the local villagers. And <laughs> so we're working on that. We'll see if I can do anything with that. That sounds fun. Okay. Unfortunately, our time on Hot 702.5 is over, but I want to keep chatting for a little bit. So we're going to say goodbye to our. Um, uh, 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 radio listeners and the remainder of this can be found tomorrow um, on both our YouTube page and on our um, uh, wherever you find your wonderful podcasts and where can people find you? Uh, the Worldwide Media Conspiracy is my company and website but you know just because it just came out check out TED Talk by Better Than The Beatles that's my band name Better Than The Beatles TED Talk it's a, it's a very funny fun music video and song so check that out right now but yeah, that's where they can find me. There or the Worldwide Media Conspiracy.com. Awesome. Well, thank you thank for you, joining Jordan. me. I really appreciate it. And I'll hear you guys, uh, we'll chat with you guys next Monday at 11 a.m. right here on Hot 702.5 FM Las Vegas. Bye. Okay, hold on. Is a hot mic, mo- has a hot mic moment? The fuck right? Hot 107, two point, whatever. <laughs> People are assholes. <laughs> <laughs>